Hey everyone, welcome back to Benchy Tests. We've got another Phenom 2 chip on the table for testing today, namely the Phenom 2 X2550 Black Edition CPU, which has an unlocked CPU multiplier, allowing for more simple overclocking. Now, this processor frustrated the hell out of me when uh, during testing, which is a story we'll go on in a story we'll go into later on in the video. But for now though, let's roll the intro and then we'll take a dive into the specs of this utter desk of a CPU. The Phenom 2 X2 550 Black Edition, released back in 2009, and as the X2 in the name suggests, it's a dual-core CPU. However, it is based on the Kalisto architecture, which is itself cut down from the Deneb architecture. So if you're lucky, and have a compatible motherboard that is, you'll be able to enable two extra cores that were disabled by default. I wasn't that lucky though, as we'll find out in a bit. That aside, it runs at 3.1GHz with a 2GHz Northbridge and Hypertransport link speed and has both DDR2 and DDR3 memory controllers so it is compatible with both AM3 and the older socket AM2 Plus motherboards as well. There are 758 million transistors inside this, built on the 45 nanometer fabrication process and there is also 128 kilobytes of L1 cache per core alongside 512 kilobytes of L2 cache per core as well, and 6 megabytes of shared L3 cache in total. And if you've watched the performance review I did of the Athlon 2 X4 640 a few videos ago, you'll know just how important that L3 cache is. First up for the non-gaming benchmarks is 7-zip, specifically the compression side of it. Decompression is up next. 7-zip's built-in benchmark is what I'm using for this. At stock, the 550 managed 6,098 MIPS, or millions of instructions per second, putting it only 2.33% down on the stock triple core Phenom 2 X3 710, showing that the increase in frequency over the 710, 3.1 GHz versus the 710's 2.6, can almost make up for the lack of that third core. And speaking of third cores, the 550 was stable with one of its two disabled cores re-enabled and was now scoring 17.47% over the 710 due to the increase in clock speed. The 550's fourth core though wasn't stable unfortunately and wouldn't allow the system to boot at all. Overclocking wise, the 550 Black Edition in its two core form managed 3.817 GHz using 1.44 to 1.456 volts. Any higher clocks simply weren't stable. And at this speed, the compression score was now effectively equaling the stock clocked three core version at 7381.67 MIPS. The three core version managed a max stable clock of 3.717 GHz, 100 MHz lower than its two core form, but needed more voltage at 1.472 to 1.488 volts for stability and was now scoring 8,739.67 MIPS, 19.16% over stock and 18.4% up on the overclocked 2 core 550. This also puts it only 1.18% behind Core 2 Quad Q8300 while having one less core, although to be fair the Q8300 does run at a slower clock speed. Decompression is next and at stock, the two-core version of the 550 was almost equal to the China-exclusive Pentium E6500K running at an overclocked speed of 3.92 GHz. Interestingly, the three-core form of the 550 was only 0.78% higher scoring than the two-core 550 at 10,171 MIPS for the three-core versus 10,092 MIPS for the two-core, making it effectively equal and also showing that in decompression at least, 7-zip isn't taking advantage of that extra core. This indifference in scores carries over to the overclocked scores as well. The 3-core part actually scores 1.99% lower than the 2-core part at 12,365.67 MIPS versus 12,416.67 MIPS. This is down to the 100 MHz higher overclock achieved on the 2-core 550. While 7-zip decompression doesn't take advantage of that third core, a fourth core does indeed make a huge difference over 3, as you can see from just how far ahead the Phenom 2 X3 710 with its disabled fourth core unlocked is compared to its 3-core form. Blender rendering is up next. 
I used the fishy cat scene created by Manu Jarvanen. Apologies, I was screwed the pronunciation of your name up there. And I set it to render a single frame and then run the benchmark three times and take an average score in seconds taken to render the frame as the final score. At stock, the 550 managed to render the frame in an average of 237.25 seconds, putting it near the bottom of the chart for now. Unlocking its third core though, drops time to render by 28.11%, down to 170.55 seconds, which would equate to a difference in time to render of almost 2 hours if I let it render the entire 100 frame animation. Not a bad difference for no extra money than what someone would have paid for the 550. The third core also puts it only 5.36% down on the Phenom 2 X3 710 at stock with its fourth core unlocked due to the 710's lower clock speed, and only 8.25% down on what the Core 2 Quad Q8300 with a 3.3GHz overclock managed. The 550's overclock itself though couldn't get it in its 2 core form up to the same level of performance as the stock 3 core. In fact, it was still 14.07% down on the stock 3-core version of itself. The overclocked 3-core version, though, was now scoring better than the overclocked Core 2 Quad with an average time to render of 147.13 seconds, 13.73% faster than stock, and 6.61% faster than the overclocked Q8300. Handbrake H264 encoding is up last before moving on to the game benchmarks. And for this, I use an actual video file uploaded to the channel, namely the file for the Athlon 2 X4640 video. This is a 1440p 60fps file with AAC audio, which I'm encoding down to 1080p 60fps at 20 megabits per second using Handbrake's CPU only H264 encoder, with the AAC audio passed straight through to the output file. To start off, the Phenom 2 X2 550 is right at the bottom of the chart, taking 103.73 minutes to encode the file, but this drops by 26.93% to 75.8 minutes with the third core unlocked, which actually puts it 12.62% up compared to the overclocked 2 core part while using less power. Overclocking the 3 core part drops time to encode even further down to 64.4 minutes, 1.18 minutes behind the stock Core 2 Quad Q8300, but 15.04% faster than itself at stock clocks. This is also 39.99% faster than what the 550 managed in its 2 core form at stock clocks. Straight into the games now, and first up is GT5 at 1080p with the lowest settings and 16x anisotropic filtering enabled. GT5 is a game well known for making great use of quad-core CPUs, so anything less than that tends to struggle. And that is no different here, at least for the 550 with its standard two cores enabled. There was a significant amount of micro stuttering throughout the city, and a lot of texture popping too, where the roads in some places took a while to actually render. The 550 with three cores enabled never had this problem. Yes, there was some minor micro stuttering on occasion, but the issues were next to non-existent when compared to the 550 with only two cores enabled. Things were better in the desert area of the map, however there were still some brief hitches here. The two core part scored average 1% and 0.1% low frame rates, 38.1, 7.4 and only 2.9 FPS respectively according to CapFrame X which technically puts it ahead of the quad-core Xeon E5310 on average frame rates, but as the 1% and 0.1% lows indicate, the stuttering with the 550 is a lot worse. The third core improved performance massively, up to 52.9, 32 and 23 FPS for average 1% and 0.1% low frame rates respectively. The overclock couldn't fix the issues the two-core part had as the stuttering was still noticeable, and the texture popping issues were still there as well. In fact, in some areas, the performance was actually worse than stock clocks. Average frame rates went up a little to 43.7, 14.8% over stock performance, but 1% lows were worse, and 0.1% lows were effectively equal. Figures for the overclocked free core part improved across the board at 60.8, 37.3, and 25.8 FPS average 1% and 0.1% lows respectively. But overall performance was actually pretty much the same, so the overclock isn't really worth it here. 
CSGO at stock clocks performed pretty badly as well on the 550 with only two cores enabled. 1080p at the lowest settings with 16x initial traffic filtering is being used here. Micro stuttering was quite noticeable throughout and made the game so jarring to watch at times that it actually made my eyes a bit sore from the strain that it was causing. The micro stuttering was weird in a way because according to the frame time graph, frame times were actually reasonably consistent for the most part. With three cores enabled, performance improved massively. Stuttering was reduced to the point that there were only a few moments where you actually notice it, although you'd also notice stuttering when turning the camera sometimes as well. Overall though, performance was great compared to only having two cores active. The benchmark figures for stock clocks with two cores aren't entirely accurate as there was an anomaly in the middle of the test which will have had an effect on them. But with three cores enabled, the 550 was able to manage average 1% and 0.1% lows of 105.1, 43.3 and 22.2 FPS respectively. The overclocked two core form of the 550 couldn't manage to equal the performance of the stock three core part with figures of 68.9, 33.8 and 18.9 FPS average 1% and 0.1% lows respectively. Two cores with an overclock actually ran relatively well compared to stock. Some micro stutter could still be seen at points throughout as well as when turning the camera. With three cores enabled, the 550 again performed great with figures of 115.3, 50.5 and 25.6 FPS for average 1% and 0.1% low frame rates respectively. There wasn't actually much of a difference to actual gameplay despite the performance boost as there was still some noticeable micro stuttering at times. In 2016's Doom, which is being run at 1080p with the lowest settings possible and 16x anisotropic filtering enabled, you can forget about using the 550 in its dual core form, and that goes for both Vulcan and OpenGL rendering modes. The game would launch but would get stuck during the initial loading screen and would not go any further. There was no such issue with the third core enabled though. Vulcan was by far the better performer as expected, which is what you're seeing here. The game actually ran great to my surprise. There were some moments of stuttering but these were minor, and that's it. There are literally no other issues. OpenGL was a different story though. That ran great for the most part, but it had noticeable stutters on occasion, as well as a moment near the end of the mission where the micro stutter was pretty noticeable. Stock clocks in Vulcan managed average 1% and 0.1% lows of 104.4, 45 and 25.4 FPS respectively. OpenGL managing 80, 32.4 and 23 FPS. The overclock, as you can see in the chart, had no effect whatsoever on the two core part in terms of allowing it to actually play the game. It also didn't really make a difference to performance with the third core enabled either. There were improvements to average and 1% lows of 7.38 and 8.89% respectively, but these increases weren't really noticeable, and performance seemed pretty much the same as stock clocks did. It was a similar story for OpenGL 2, which also had pretty similar performance compared to stock clocks, with only one FPS difference in 1% lows, and barely anything at all between the 0.1% lows. Overall, you'd be better off with the Xeon E5310 with an overclock despite the lower average, due to the far better 1% and 0.1% lows, meaning less stuttering. There were even more issues for the 2 core 550 and Rise of the Tomb Raider which is also running at 1080p with 16x anisotropic filtering and the lowest settings in DX11 mode. There was significant stuttering at the start of the test, which had a pretty major effect on combat. Scripted sequences were problematic to say the least. I mean, just look at this guy. You alright mate? Mate. Mate. Oi, mate. Um, yeah, he's not doing too good. Anyway, this meant there was no point in continuing with the 550 as a dual core CPU, so let's get the triple core footage up on screen. There was semi noticeable micro stuttering throughout, with moments where there were significant but thankfully brief stutters as well. There were also still issues with some of the scripted sequences in that they either took ages to actually start or not at all, such as in one in which you are running from a helicopter where when you slide down a particular rope, a cutscene is supposed to start with Lara falling into the water. This didn't happen, meaning you ended up falling to your death and having to go through it again to continue. The 3 core config at stock clocks achieved average 
1% and 0.1% lows of 53.8, 17.6 and 7.7 FPS respectively, which as you can see didn't really improve much at all with the overclock, with only 3.3 and 2.6 FPS improvements to average and 1% lows respectively. The dual core 550 did improve quite a bit to be honest, and by improvement I mean it got further into the test than it did before. The stuttering was still really severe, but the game breaking issue this time was important objects, such as ladders you literally need to climb in order to proceed in the mission, didn't render at all, or they at least didn't render within the time I was willing to sit there and wait. Power draw in the handbrake benchmark that I run is actually a bit higher than the blender benchmark I use, but due to how impractical measuring power draw in handbrake is, blender will have to do. At stock, the dual core 550 pulled 49.13 watts and down the CPU power cable plus or minus 3%, which is pretty much equal to the Core 2 Quad Q8300, despite rendering the frame 20.5% slower than the Q8300 did. Power draw went up by 26.73% to 62.26 watts with the third core enabled, putting it level with the Phenom 2 X3710 with its fourth core enabled which completed the benchmark 5.08% faster than the free core 550. Power draw shot up substantially with the overclock. 89.01 watts plus or minus 3% for the 2 core 550. A massive 81.17% more power than stock, despite scoring only 18% better, showing just how inefficient the phenoms are with an overclock. The free core 550 sees a similar increase at 114.91 watts or 84.56% more power in stock for only a 13.73% decrease in time to render. The overclocked 2 core part is 14.07% slower in time to render than the stock 3 core part but is pulling significantly more power. Idle power draw at stock clocks is pretty similar, 23.1 watts plus or minus 3% for the 2 core 550 and 23.59 watts for the free core part, and was close enough to be within margin of error and therefore is effectively equal. This changes a little with the overclock which has the two core part pulling 44.9 watts, 5.81% less than the free core 550 at 47.67 watts plus or minus 3%. That's still nothing on the free and four core phenom to X3710s with an overclock though, which pulled 74.18 and 75.03 watts respectively at idle. To finish up today, Phenom 2 X2 550 Black Edition really isn't a CPU you'd want to use for relatively modern gaming, at least not in its standard dual code form, as it struggles to run modern games at best, and at worst they won't run at all, just they just won't. If you're able to unlock it to either a 3 or even 4 core CPU, then you might be able to enjoy a lot of modern games. However, if you can only manage to unlock the 3rd core, you'd probably be better off picking up a higher clocked Core 2 Quad. That aside, you'll remember that at the start I mentioned how frustrating this CPU was to test and bloody hell was it frustrating. The problems came when overclocking the CPU. There were numerous blue screen errors which pointed to RAM problems despite the RAM being perfectly fine. These seemed to happen at random during testing with no indication as to why. It was so bad that it got to the point where I lost any and all motivation for benchmarking it and just wanted the testing to be over so, so badly. So with that out of the way, there's only one thing left that I want to do with Venom 2 X2 350 Black Edition. I'm so happy that landed on the bed. Before I close out the video today, I'd like to give shout outs to Patreon supporters Tasfi Dodge, Shadow in the Void and Peter for helping to make all of this possible. So everyone, if you enjoyed the video, leave a comment and a like, and subscribe to the channel if you'd like to see more content like this. And don't forget to share the video as well. And you can support me in creating these videos through my Patreon at patreon.com forward slash benchytests or through Kofi at kofi.com forward slash benchy tests. And remember, Kofi has a hyphen between the KO and FI. But if you do decide to become a patron, you'll gain early access to all of my videos before the public does, for as long as you remain a patron. So thanks for watching, hopefully we'll see you in the next one.